Okay, cool. Let's get started. So today we're going to talk about um, several kind of smaller topics. Um, so I'm going to talk about dot files. Um, then Jose is going to talk about backups and OS automation. Then John's going to talk about machine introspection, like uh, OS monitoring, kind of single machine DevOps. Uh, and then I'll talk about program introspection, which is like debuggers and profilers and that sort of thing. So for our first topic, we're going to talk about dot files, uh, which is a topic we actually touched on briefly in the last class on editors when we looked at our VimRC files um, for configuring this editor. So uh, a lot of these command line programs are pretty configurable using plain text files called dot files. Um, the reason they're called dot files is because their file names literally begin with a dot, like this vimrc file is the file of period vimrc in the home directory. And the, the reason it's like that, there's a kind of interesting history behind it. So if you notice, like if I go into my home directory where I am right now and I type in ls, um, I don't see that file, even though it does exist, like if I do head to the slash dot vimrc, like there's some content there. So why don't I see it in the directory listing? Well, that file is hidden by default. If I do ls dash a, a is for all it shows me all the files in this directory, including all the things that stop, start with the dot. Um, and so this is a kind of useful thing because you put stuff that you don't want to see in directory listings all the time in files that start with the dot and they don't bother you, but you can find them if you need to. Um, the reason this is implemented like this is almost like a historical accident. You can read more about it if you're interested. But what happened was that early versions of the LS tool um, had a thing where they hid the directory entry for the current directory. So if you do a directory listing with dash a, you'll see that every directory has dot and dot dot in there. And what those represent is that dot is the current directory and dot dot is the parent directory. And when we normally look at directory listings, like we always we know that like there is a directory that we're in. Just having a dot there doesn't really help us. But if we look at, um, if I do dash l, it gives me some additional information. If I want to get this additional information about this directory dot, um, well, it can be kind of useful to have there. And so there's this line of code in the, the C code for the LS tool where it compared the first character of each directory that it was about to print, or each file that it was about to print, and if the first character was a dot, it skipped it, unless you had the dash A option. And so this had the side effect that any file that had a file in that happened to start with dot, even though it wasn't dot or dot dot, the current directory or parent directory, it was still skipped. And so then people started abusing this feature, or this kind of like implementation bug in LS, in order to use it to implement hidden files. Um, so that's why dot files are called dot files. Um, and so all these different command line tools have configuration files that often live in the home directory, um, things like that dot vimrc, or uh, files like say dot git config. So we also looked at the git um, version control system last lecture, John talked about that. That tool is configurable through this file that lives in the home directory called git config. And you can pretty heavily customize it by writing a lot of stuff in there. Um, so, Different tools are configured in different ways. Um, to learn about how to configure any particular tool, you'll have to read that particular tool's documentation. Sometimes it's through the programming language for the tool. So if you want to configure your shell, well, your shell just reads a bunch of files on your disk and interprets them as shell scripts on startup. Um, similarly, like for Vim, Vim is programmable through a language called VimScript. And so the Vim configuration file is just a VimScript file that's loaded on startup. So sometimes these are full programming languages that you can use um, to set the different settings for your program. Other times, like for files like the git configuration file, this isn't exactly a program, it's just a particular file format, and you just set a bunch of uh, settings to different values. And uh, so we think that customizing and adapting your tools to behave exactly the way you want to is totally worth investing time in. Um, and. Uh, one thing that some people do is they go online and find configurations that other people use for these tools and just kind of download them and use them as is. And we recommend against doing that because you really should figure out like what you want your tool to do and customize it so it best fits your needs because your needs may not be the same as somebody else's. Um, but it can be helpful to figure out how other people have customized their tools just to see like what kinds of options are available. And so you probably have some dot files set up already. So like some places you could look. Like you can go on your own local machine and look at the file dot bash rc in your home folder. Um, does everybody understand like what these Unix style paths mean? Hopefully people have at least this level of exposure to 
instead of Phoenix. Great. So you could look at this file. You probably have something there, um, maybe some minimal configuration where you say setting your bash prompt to something. We looked at these in the shell lecture. Now if I, uh, whoops, if I run bash, it will interpret that bash rc that I wrote and like set my prompt to this thing that I just changed it to. Um, other places to look are the files like tilde slash dot emacs for your configuration for emacs, or tilde slash dot vim for settings for vim and so on. Um, so yeah, the different ways you can learn to customize your tools are uh, you can go online and just look at tutorials that people have written. So oftentimes these tools are really heavily customizable. You can look at the manual pages for them to see all the different options, like you do man and then the name of the tool. Sometimes, sometimes it'll list out all the different configuration options that can go in the configuration file. Um, like uh, there's one particular program that's called Axel, which downloads uh, files from the internet. Um, and it says, oh, like tilde slash dot axlrc is a file that you use for configuration. Um, and for this particular tool, it says that the settings that go in there are not documented in the man page, but it tells you where to find those settings. Um, but yeah, other things you can do is you can just go on the internet and Google like axlrc, and then you'll find different people have configured their programs to behave in certain ways and oftentimes have written some amount of documentation for what these different configuration options do. Um, another thing you can do is just directly go and scan through, browse through people's dot files. Um, so like, if you go on GitHub, you can go to the search bar, type in dot file, and a bunch of people have repositories on GitHub containing all their configurations, and then you can just go look at them and be like, oh, like, let's see what this guy did. Looks like he has a pretty popular repository. And then you can go and see like, oh, what are different ways you can configure Git? Well, it's in the Git config file. And then this is all documented. You can kind of pull in one of these configurations at a time and just see what it does. So it's a good way of exploring things. Okay, so that's the very basics of like, what is a dot file and why you should bother to figure out how to configure your tools. But now we want to talk a little bit more about how you should organize these files and kind of different things you can do to um, keep your settings consistent across different machines you might use. If you put a lot of effort into uh, customizing your setup on your local machine, um, say on your laptop, and then you go and work on a different desktop computer somewhere, or you work on Athena or something, you don't want all your software to suddenly behave really differently, right? Once you get used to your super customized setup, say with customized key binding for your editors and lots of nice shortcuts for your shell and so on, you want that configuration to be kind of easy to replicate across different machines and easy to keep in sync. And so, uh, yeah, next we're gonna talk a little bit about how you should organize your dot files. But uh, before we do that, are there any questions about the basics, like what is a dot file or why you should bother? Yeah. So there are like programs like Selfless, Selfless that have um, ST, so they don't have like dot files. So how do they like work? Uh, I'm not familiar with that particular program. Can you repeat it? So like, there are some things that like they don't have dot files, like ST. So they're like Selfless or. Yeah, so the Selfless tools, usually the configuration is compiled into the program. Oh, okay. uh, so you actually, the way you configure it is by editing the source code of the terminal and then changing the settings you want. It's extremely painful, but it doesn't mean that you have a, uh, it doesn't mean that you can change whatever you want. So the idea of the Selfless tools is basically that they're all just a single file. So they should be relatively easy for you to maintain. But in terms of configuration, they're pretty painful. Yeah, good question. Um, another related issue, like for these command line tools, they're all configurable really nicely through these plain text files. But for other programs you might use on your system, like say your web browser or something, uh, doesn't really use a plain text file for configuration, so it's a little bit harder to replicate configurations across machines. But they're you know, tool, or they're more specific uh, tool you can use for that. So for your web browser. I can sign in to my Google account and use that to synchronize my um, configuration, things like that. Is there another question? Oh, to, to touch on that, there are like some, like you can find like some tools, like for example, like I can think of MDB, like to play videos, that do use like dot files instead of just having like a settings window when you're still like clicking checkboxes. So that's like really convenient if you just kind of compile them and like use them. Cool. 
Okay, so next let's talk about how we can organize our doc files. So hopefully by now you're convinced that it's like it's worth customizing your tools. But now, yeah, you might use multiple machines. Or even if you're using a single machine, it's, it's really nice to keep track of all your settings in some principled way. Um, so what are some goals you might have in organizing your doc files? Well, one thing we, uh, we should do is we should make it really easy to install. So like if I go onto a new machine, say one that I've never used before, all of a sudden all the tools work differently than I'm used to because I've customized my stuff very heavily. Well, it should be the case then that I can very easily install my own personalization on that machine. And so maybe a goal we might have is like, we keep a bunch of stuff under version control and then to install it we should just be able to clone a repository and like run a single script that'll get everything set up the way we want. So easy installation is one goal. Um, another goal we should have is portability. So you want your configuration to be the same everywhere. It should be easy to synchronize back and forth between your configurations on different machines. So if I use my local machine and then I say SSH into a DNA for ease of use, I'll SSH it onto one of my own machines. Like everything behaves the same way on this machine as it does on my local machine. Um, and if I make a change on my local machine, it's easy to synchronize over to this remote machine. And then the final thing is, I think it's really important that you track your changes in your configuration. Um, if, you, uh, if you think about it, your configuration of your machine in a way is like the longest project you'll ever work on, right? Like for your entire programming career, you'll be using these different tools and you'll probably be fiddling with the configuration as you go. And it's just really nice to have all that under version control so you can see like what you changed at a certain point or why you changed it or things like that. Um, if I go to my own doc files repository, for example, and like look at any particular file in there, I can go and figure out like, okay, like when did I add this particular alias um, for Git? And I can go and say, like, oh, like back in 2013, I made this particular change where I added a bunch of stuff, and like here's why I changed it. Um, it's just really nice to have that history. Sometimes you make a configuration change, you realize you don't like it, you want to go back to an old version. Having all this history there is super useful. And so how do we achieve these different things? Well, so I think one nice way to organize things is have a single folder that contains all your configuration, have that folder under version control, um, maybe put it on GitHub as a public or private repository depending on how you feel about what you put in there, um, and then have a single script set up so that when you run that script, it's like you know, type in the name of the script, press enter, and it configures everything. Um, and then if you make that installer script item code, which means like if you run it multiple times, it doesn't do anything bad. Well, then synchronizing your doc files across machines is really easy. Like if I make a change on my local machine, I add the change and then push it to the Git remote. And then on my other machine, I go into my doc files folder, do a Git pull, and just run the installer script, and it will set everything up for me. Um, so just to show you a little bit more details of how we can go about setting something like this up, uh, I can just demonstrate it in front of you. Um, and this is all in the lecture notes, so you don't need to remember the exact commands I type in. But uh, it'll show you how you might want to organize things. So first I'm going to go ahead and make a directory uh, called doc files, where I'm going to keep all my settings. I'm putting it in a location where I'm going to get rid of it later because I already have all the stuff set up. But here we go. And then, okay, so all my settings are going to go in here. And I want to keep this entire directory under version control. So we talked a little bit about Git last lecture, and that's our tool of choice. So we do Git init, and now this is set up as a Git repository with no commits yet. And now I can start migrating over my configurations I've already set up on my machine. Um, but now, for now, let's pretend that I have no settings at all. So I'll just start creating some settings. Say I want to configure my shell, so I'll create the bash rc file. And I can start putting my settings in there, like say I want to customize my prompt. So remember from our shell lecture, um, bash looks at the PS1 variable and that kind of tells it how, how to draw the prompt. And so I might want it to show like the current directory I'm in and then like a dollar sign and then a space and that'll be my prompt. Um, if I open up bash and type in this thing, like, that's my shell prompt now. So okay, now I have this directory and it has a file in it called bash rc but uh, this is not where bash reads its configuration from, right? Bash reads its configuration from the file tilde slash dot bash rc. Um, so how do I reconcile that? Like one thing I could do is instead of keeping this 
dot files directory under version control. Maybe I could just go to my home folder and then set up my entire home folder as a Git repository and then track these specific files in there. Um, turns out that's actually a bad idea. Does anybody know why? So if I want to be tracking just specific files, like just my Git, can, uh, just my program configuration, like dot file, if I keep my entire home directory under version control, well, there's a bunch of other stuff in there, right? Like my photos are in there, and my like I have other Git repositories within there for all my programs and stuff. And so I can set up like this top level Git uh, repository to like ignore all the other stuff underneath it. But it's kind of easy to use the wrong Git command and accidentally delete stuff inside a Git repository that you're ignoring. Um, so it turns out that's not a super great approach. So instead, what we think is a better way to do things is to, in a sense, like have a folder where you have all your configurations and then copy all these files into the right place. So like if I copy this bash rc into tilde slash dot bash rc, and then like now I run bash, I see my um, shell prompt that I've configured in this bash rc file because it's reading it from this copy. Um, but there's a problem when you use copies. What's uh, kind of annoying about it is that, well, now you have two copies of the same thing and now you have to worry about keeping them in sync, right? Like, if you just directly go and make changes to this version, well, it's not going to update this version, which is the thing that's actually inside your Git repository and is you're tracking what different versions of, right? Um, so there's actually a nice solution to this. It's something called symbolic links. Um, and basically what you do is, like, in, your file system has support for a kind of thing where you have a file that's just a pointer to another file. It's like a shortcut or alias. Um, so I'm going to delete my um, copy of bashrc and instead use the ln command. This, is, this says create a symbolic link. Um, and I'm going to create a symbolic link to uh, this like actual data that's in my Git repository. And give it the name tilde slash dot bash rc. And so if I look at a directory listing <coughs> for my home directory, I'll see that bash rc now points to the actual content that's tracked in my dot files repository, right? And so now I'll see if I load up bash, oops, not bash rc, the program's called bash. Um, if I load up bash, it does read from this configuration file, even though the file is not actually here, because there's a symbolic link. So when bash tries to open this <coughs> file, it just kind of transparently ends up reading from here instead. Um, okay, so now we kind of know like we have a single folder where all our settings are, and then these settings files need to end up in different places, and we create these symbolic links to make pointers in the right places to point to this underlying content that's in our dot files directory. Um, but uh, having to do this on every machine is kind of painful, right? Like we might have a bunch of different configuration in here. I might have a file vimrc for my vim settings, and I might have a file axlrc for my axle settings and so on. And if I say copy this dot files folder, all my settings to a different machine, and then I want to apply all these settings, well, that involves copying or making symbolic links to these files um, one by one, and that's kind of annoying. And so what we should do is we should create an install script that does this linking for us. And so that's actually really easy to do. Um, I'll make a file called install and make it executable. Remember, we saw a little bit of this during the shell lecture. And now I can start editing this install script. Um, and it's actually pretty simple. So, uh, so uh, I'll explain what this does in a second. Um, Okay, so this is all the script needs to do. It needs to have lines like this. So first, it figures out what directory the script is in, and then changes the current directory to that directory. And then one by one, the script just calls the ln command to set up all the symbolic links. So what this line says is, okay, like look at the current directory um, and take the bashrc file that's in the current directory and set up a symbolic link in tilde slash dot bashrc. And then I'll do something similar for all my other files. So I have a file in here called vimrc, and I want to symlink it to the file tilde slash dot vimrc, and so on. And so now once I have the script, um, setup is really easy, I can just uh, run the script. Oops. And it will 
create the symbolic links for me. Um, what's kind of annoying about this particular setup is that you can try to run the script again and again. Well, if the files already exist, it complains. And so now we can go back and write a slightly more sophisticated script. Um, but for now, we're just going to ignore the errors and it will, whoops. You can also redirect the output of this thing. So it throws away whatever error message is printing. And now we have something that kind of looks like it works. Now, this isn't actually the ideal approach to use. And there's some slightly more sophisticated tools you can use instead of writing your own script to do this whole linking business. And we've linked to those uh, in the lecture notes. But at a high level, that's how these things work. They just take files that you give them and symlink them into the right place. And now remember, I've set up this whole thing as a Git repository so I can start actually committing to this repository. And now I have history of my changes. And so I've made my first change to my dot files and I can go and fiddle with my settings some more. Say I want to change my batch prompt to say something slightly different. Maybe I don't like the dollar sign and I want to change that to like this uh, angle bracket. I can go make that change. If I go here to get status, I'll see, okay, like I've modified some file. Um, and I can go and say like update batch prompt. And this way I have a history of all my changes. If I now upload these on GitHub, I can uh, set GitHub up as a Git remote and then just do a git push to synchronize all my changes on my local machine to GitHub. And then if I'm on a different machine, I can just do git pull and then the URL for my dot files. And then to set it up, I can just go into the directory and run the install script. And this is kind of like, to set up a new machine, I just do a git clone, cd into the directory, dot flash install, and then it's done. Um, and so this is how you can have your configuration replicated across machines and nicely synchronized and track all the versions. And so everything we've showed you here, with the exception of this install script, is I think the right way to do it. Um, instead of writing a hacky install script, there's some slightly nicer programs that people have written. Um, and we've given you links to those. Um, and so it's totally worth setting this up in the right way. I'm sure that it will be your like, longest lived software project you ever work on. Yeah. I just wanted to share that Anish is being really humble. He like, created Dropbox, but she does exactly this. It's on GitHub. He's like one of the creators of one of these things. Yeah, so there, there are lots of tools that like simulate your files into the right place. Um, I wrote one of these because I didn't like what was already out there, but there are like lots of different tools that have slightly different uh, ways you use them. We've also linked to like me, John, and Jose all have lots of configuration files we've written, um, and ours are pretty reasonably well documented. So we've linked to these um, in the course notes if you're interested in seeing like how this setup has been set up like whatever, the shell prompt and having like the git status on the side and like whatnot, that's all available for you to steal from. Yeah. Do you have a recommended way for testing? Like, for example, like, let's say you try to get a virtual like new Mac, right? Like, not all of us can just like grab a new Mac and like, te test or set up on some new Mac, right? You can just spin up a VM and just like get to run the script and see if everything works. Yeah, yeah do you have like a recommendation? I think you can install macOS in a VM now, right? Yeah. Okay. yeah. But also, like, okay, so I think I don't really bother to do that. Um, I'm just, and I do play around with my configuration sometimes. I'm just somewhat careful with what I test out to, like, try not to break things so much that I have to reinstall my OS. I think for most things, like, you can probably just do them on your current setup, and it's fine. Um, and especially when things are under version control, like, Pretty easily play with stuff and then revert changes if you don't want them anymore. Yeah, yeah good questions. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, and if you go look at like people's projects, uh, so we've linked to these, you can find lots of doc files online. You'll, you'll find like there are tons of configuration files for many different tools, and every tool is really heavily customizable. Well, for a lot of people, like they've been working on these projects for many, many years. It's kind of cool to look through. Um, different people will have different um, ways they like have a, a one-click way of like installing their dot files. So here's a kind of analog to the install script that we wrote, except this one actually does a lot of things better than ours. Like we'll be careful about overwriting files and things like that. 
So it's totally worth taking a look at these things and setting them up properly. Um, I'll briefly talk about uh, one more topic that's just kind of worth knowing about. Uh, one thing you might want to do once you start using multiple machines is have slightly different configuration for a machine. Like, for example, I use kind of overall the same configuration on here, but also on Athena, um, and also on some machines I have in my room. Some have different hardware, different uh, settings for that hardware. Um, and so my dot files are like 99% the same between all these machines, but there's some tiny changes. And so how do you deal with that? Where you like want to have a Git repository and kind of like nicely track changes. And so we've written a bunch of details on this in the um, notes, so you can find those online, but I'll just briefly mention some of them now. Uh, some things you can do are, within these configuration files, for a lot of them, they're not just like configuration, just data, but it's actually programs you're writing. Like for your bash RC file, it's just a bash script. And so you can have conditionals in here. So like one thing you could do is like, here I'm not writing actual code anymore. Um, I can do something like, oh, like if this code is running on like my laptop, then do something um, else if postname equals like GPU machine, do something else and so on. So uh, you can set up conditionals in your settings to do different things based on the environment. Um, some other approaches you can use, a lot of these tools uh, support, well, like reading and executing code from yet another file. So one thing you can do, or like one thing I've done for example, is in my git config, I have all these settings that are common between machines, and then at the bottom of my configuration, I've uh, written this include command. And so what this does is it says like, okay, look at this other file and uh, process the contents from there too. And so I can have this file be common between all my machines and I can have small machine specific tweaks if I need them in this particular file. Um, so those are two approaches you can use to deal with different configurations on different files. Um, yeah, so lots more links, uh, links to resources in the course notes. And of course, feel free to post on Piazza about this if you have any questions. Um, and I'm also happy to take any questions now. Okay, so next, uh, Jose is going to talk about some things, and then we will have a break. <laughs>